Hello and welcome to the first episode of our Anna Down Heritage podcast. This is Paul Graney, chairperson of the Heritage Society, and I'm joined by Evelyn Stevens for our first episode on what it's like to live in a thatched cottage. So welcome, Evelyn. Thank you, Paul. So you live in a thatched cottage. Yes. For a good number of years now. Yeah, for a long number of years. We came here in 1980. Okay. Uh, you're living in, in Clumbu. Yes. In Anadown Parish. Maybe you can start by uh, telling me how you came to live in a thatched cottage. Sure. Uh, I'd, I'd lived in Galway City before that. Uh, when Pete and I got together, we rented a thatched house in Killeen over on the Tume Road. Um, okay. It didn't have running water. It was much more primitive than this one. But we really liked the feeling of a thatched cottage. It felt very kind of organic. So uh, then Pete started to look for a house to buy and this one came on the market and it was a very good price. That was uh, part of the reason for buying it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he bought this house in 1980. The, 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 there had been two lots of uh, people who lived in the house after the original family, uh, between, mm. uh, between the original family and us. So they, were, they probably made some changes to the house. But the mm. original family, I presume, had lived here for a long, long, long time. Their name is, is associated with it um, mm -hmm. on the, the various records. Yes. OK. So what condition was the house in when you when you started out and what had to be done? It was uh, the walls were obviously intact. There was a, th a thatch on the house, but but it was in very bad condition. It was letting in water. Um, now, it was still when I say it was in very bad condition, it was still intact, even though leaking in spots. You know, because mm. you can see uh, with thatched houses, when they're beginning to fall in, they develop quite big holes. And we didn't have that. It was just spots letting in, letting in the rain. And mm. they, we had to get new windows and door in. Uh, so they were in fairly bad condition. But we, we could live in it at the same time. We were actually able to live in it, even though the thatch was letting in. <laughs> we have experience of that over the years, how to live with, mm -hmm. with rain coming in. <laughs> and uh, and we got the new new windows and doors in. Now, having said that, when I say we got them in, I think one of the, the main points we very quickly discovered was that you had to be able to do DIY because um, otherwise you'd be forever getting somebody into a tradesman, a tradesman or tradeswoman in to do the work. So Pete uh, put in the, the new windows and doors. No, he, he wasn't. He didn't begin to do thatching. That was a different question. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so constant maintenance exactly exactly constant maintenance up to this day since 1980 <laughs> <laughs> lots of hard work yeah but you enjoy it we we enjoy it enormously um you know we both lived in in modern houses up to that point and they're easier to maintain but but they, they just don't have have the connection to the past um we, we both really very much enjoy that and it kind of increases your awareness of the countryside around you and what, what the other markers of, of the old way of life are. You know, like, well, even, even down to the fact that Tumbu village has the structure of an old Clochan village with um, some new houses, but a lot of the old houses still here with the, the same kind of higgledy-piggledy arrangement mm -hmm. that, that was true in days gone by. Yeah. And... I suppose there are there are quite a number of thatched houses still in the village. There are, there are, yeah. Some some in good condition, some greatly in need of repair, which I hope will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are thatched houses, and also something that you see a lot in in villages throughout the countryside is houses which would have been thatched, but which now have tiles or, or slate roofs. But they're always very identifiable. They have that nice mm -hmm. kind of more organic kind of a shape about them. Than modern yes, houses. you can see the same structure remains there underneath the, exactly. the roof. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I suppose, Paul, what we over time we've also realised that these houses they haven't always been treated in the appropriate way in modern times because a lot of them, including this house, would have had a, a concrete plaster put on the house, mm. and really they should have been treated. They should just have been treated with lime. Lime a lime mortar or lime lime plaster not not with concrete because the the, the way they worked was with um it, what most you could get get in through the stone and through the lime the lime render but could also get out 
whereas concrete, mm. if, if moisture gets in, it's not going to be able to get out through the concrete. Yes. So we, we discovered that we, in a big way when one one gable end, the, the plaster began to come off and we could see that this was going to hold. Plaster was going to come off the, the outside of the gable. Mm-hmm. So we called in um, a lime expert, Patrick McAfee is his name, and he, he stuck a shovel in behind and pulled the plaster off. It just the whole thing just came off. And his first comment frightened the wits out of it. He said, oh, this is a mud house. We thought, oh, wow, <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't what we were expecting. But what he meant was that mud had been included in the mortar. So it would have been okay. lime and sand and mud was what was mm. used um, to, to bind the stone together. It was actually a stone house. It is actually a stone house. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's a, you should kind of view it as a, a kind of a, a living structure then. You have the thatch and the, the lime mortar and it's all working together as one system. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other the other aspect, of course, is that there isn't a, a damp course under the floor. So you, you just mm. have to be careful in different parts of the house that you don't put anything permanent down on the floor. So the, the dampness doesn't seep up unless there's something sitting on it. You know, it needs okay. a bit of capillary attraction or something like that. Mm. So you, you can live perfectly well with it as long as you know what how to handle it. Okay. So will we talk a bit then about thatching itself? Yes. Yeah. So when, when we came to the house, as, as I said um, at the very beginning, the, the thatch was in quite bad condition. So and we were very ignorant about uh, how to get a thatcher. So we asked locally and we were given one name and we went to him. He was an old man and he said he agreed to do it and he came. Um, and you know, we, we were both going to work, Pete and I. So we mm. disappear for the day and he would do his work um, and I'd bring him home in the evening. But we, we only found out afterwards that, first of all, he was going to the pub every day while we were gone. <laughs> I'm not naming any names. Um, and the straw that he used was really bad. It wasn't it hadn't been it, had, it wasn't hadn't been hand hand slashed. So mm. it wasn't the right length and wasn't in, in good condition. So he finished the roof and it looked OK, but within a year, the thatch had started to slip down off the roof, oh. which was a bit frightening. Um, mm. So we by then we knew an awful lot more about everything to do with thatch. And we'd heard about a, a thatcher in Hedford called Jimmy Moran and called him in and he, he agreed that it had been a very bad job. It needed to come off and that he mm. would do the job. So that was uh, in 1983. He did a full thatch for us and it was absolutely fantastic. You could see the difference immediately. There was no mm. slipping in this case. Yes. Yeah. And that was that was all with wheat and straw. Um, and up to this year, up to 2020, the, the thatch has been full, full thatch. We've had two full thatches and a number of um, the, the comb being the, the, the straw at the top of the roof, at the ridge of the roof. That has to be replaced more frequently than the full thatch. So that had to be done about every seven years. But the full thatch, the full wheat and thatch lasts about 20 years. So Jimmy Moran did one and then John Joe Duggan did another one uh, approximately mm. 20 years later. And uh, Marie Killeen, the Dutch thatcher, as is shown in the in the video on the Heritage uh, Society website, she did the a full wreath thatch in 2020. But unfortunately, by this stage, there's hardly anybody growing wheat suitable for thatch. So she had mm. to use reeds, even though she herself prefers to use wheat. OK, so she, she used reeds. Yeah. And in fact, John Joe Duggan, there was a fantastic scheme going on in his case because he was growing his own wheat and he was saving his his, his wheat grain from year to year and growing mm. it from his own grain. And it meant that he kept a, a very suitable form of wheat for thatching, a longer form of wheat than the modern wheat. OK. Uh, and that that la- he did that for years and then he became allergic to that, to wheat, and he had to stop using it. But ah. he, he sent his, um, I'm not sure how this got organised, but I know he sent a sample of his of the wheat grain to Trinity College in Dublin, where they they investigated the well, the DNA, I suppose, and it showed that it was a very old version of wheat that he was using. OK, interesting. So at least there's some of that seed still, I, I presume they still have that stored in Trinity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. John Joe, very much of the opinion that the Thatcher should grow his own thatch, his own wheat. Yeah. Yes. And that I, th- I think that that was how it was done from talking to other people. I mean, obviously, we're living in this house in a more modern way, so we're not growing our we don't have the land anyway, but we're not mm. growing our own wheat uh, for patching the thatch. But that would have yes. been the norm. People would have grown a small area of wheat when the, they, they knew they needed to patch the thatch 
and uh, mm. in fact that, that was I, I gather that was mostly what was done that the thatch was th there would have been a full thatch from time to time but probably not as frequently as every 20 years because it would have been patched and patched and patched uh, mm. from year to year when it was needed mm. and maybe you'd have got the thatcher in for the full thatch and then yeah. the, the owner of the house would have patched it himself yes, in many cases exactly exactly mm. but you still see and, and we've had it done as well we've had to have odd patches where, where there would have been a leak like even, even last year in 2019 we had a leak coming in in one part of the the roof at the back while we were waiting for mm. the full thatch to be done and marika came and just patched that spot um, so you could see then on the roof that most of the straw was one dark brownish colour and the patch would be a lighter colour and you could see actually see the scallops on the outside as well where you normally don't see them mm. um, the scallops being the the hazel twigs that are used to hold down the thatch okay so i could just go on on that for a second paul seeing as i mentioned that that in this method there, there are different methods of thatching used even in county galway but in other parts of the country this particular method involves using scallops, which are twisted, a twisted hazel branch or twig, which are, they're, they're, it's like a hairpin and they're used to, to pin down the straw or reed into the underlying layer. But the, the, the straw or reed is built up layer by layer on top of that and it, it has the effect of covering up the previous row of scallops so you don't see them. You just see, mm -hmm. you just, the overall effect is a uniform layer of straw or reed rather than seeing the scallops which pin it down. You can only see mm. them at the very top in the in the comb where the, there's a certain amount of decoration and, and the scallops are shown. Mm -hmm. So does thatching vary then from region to region or are there different methods used in different parts of the country or do you know anything about that? I know a little bit about it, Paul. Um, I know on, the, on, on Inish Man, where I, I like to visit, I saw um, people harvesting rye by hand uh, and rye is what, what's used there for thatching. But they, they also use a different method because it's obviously it's so exposed to wind. They have a method where they use ropes. Um, I think it was shown recently on a, on a TG Car program where actually Marika was shown thatching on Inishir where they, they use horizontal um, and vertical ropes to, to tie down the thatch. That, that keeps mm. it more secure against the wind. Um, in fact, on, just on different materials used on the roof, I think it was shown also in the video of thatching by Marika on the, the Heritage website. Underneath the layers of, of wheat, there was a layer of bog grass shown. So this house mm. would have been thatched with bog grass at a certain point. Um, also on Inishman, underneath where in our thatch, uh, the bottom layer under the wheat or reeds is what's called scraws, which is basically the top layer of of grass um, taken off an area of bog or of where there's fairly dense dense grass growth kind of a boggy area I think is what they mm. used so that's what's under the thatch but on the Iron Islands underneath that again um, I've seen rush um, bracken you know ferns used under the under the scrawls. So that would have been an extra layer of insulation. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and yeah. um, I also saw in Donegal this summer um, a thatch made of a material I didn't recognise at all until I came back and showed Marika the photographs and it's actually it was actually flex. So that that makes a very kind of a it's, it's very it's a it's a very fine straw like material and it's it's done with without a kind of a, a comb. It's it's rounded off at the top. So the, the flex is sort of rounded rounded over the ridge of the roof and down the other side. Okay. Yeah. And that was also tied down with ropes and the ropes were pinned onto uh, stones which were protruding from the, the top of the of the building. Oh. Yeah. So very, very secure. Mm. So I know that um, Fidelma Milan, who's a, um, a thatch expert, a vernacular housing expert, she's written about thatch and I think she's quite nervous that with reed now being introduced that thatch is becoming more uniform throughout the country, that the old, all the, that variety of different materials and different ways of thatching will disappear, which which is a pity, um, yes. but at least it's documented to an extent. Mm. I suppose maybe there needs to be some encouragement for, for people to, to grow the traditional materials then to oh, maintain that, that a be, bit. Yeah, actually that's that's a good point. It would be a great help. We, we do, we did get a, a, a grant I mean, maybe I'll give you this information now because it might be useful to other people. We got mm. a grant from it's via the it's via the heritage section of government, but it comes through the county council through the heritage 
section of the local county council and mm. also from the Department of the Environment directly. Um, and you can get up to 50% of the cost of thatch from that. But it's still mm. quite costly. And I think around here, some of the people who live in thatched houses might find it quite hard even to get the 50% together that they'd need for thatching. So I, I really think that, that there should be more support for, for people, especially people of pension age, more financial mm -hmm. support for people to do thatching. If, 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 it's, if it's felt that thatched houses are an important part of our heritage, which I Absolutely. definitely think they are, I think there should mm -hmm. be more support. And that could include support for growing the, whatever financial support is needed for growing the, the, the grains, the old grains, the old straw. Yeah, it would be important that that would be included then as well, yeah. Yes. And yeah. I suppose, yeah, we, we do see houses around the place that, that do unfortunately have the thatch falling in. So yeah, exactly. more support is definitely needed, I think, for, for houses like that who are going to lose them. Definitely, definitely, yeah. So did either of you grow up in a thatched house? We didn't fall, no. Uh, well, Pete came from England originally, uh, from a town, and I came from County Sligo, and there were very few thatched houses there. Then when the family moved to County Galway, to the Carla Strand area, I became aware, even, even when young, um, of some kind of a, a negative attitude towards thatched houses and that people really were, I think people felt a little bit ashamed of living in a thatched house. That was the feeling I got. That's, mm. That was me kind of under age 12, you know, from, yes. just being, from being around other children. That was something shameful about living in a thatched house and people were very keen to get rid of them. So th that was the feeling I had then. But then when, when Pete and I began to look for housing, in fact, you know, I think I said one of the reasons we got this house was that it was quite cheap. So in other words, they weren't, you know, the people weren't falling over themselves to buy thatched houses then in the in the 1980s either. Mm. But I think things have changed now. The people here who pass by this house really, really appreciate seeing the new thatch, the, the, the beautiful thatch that there is on this house now and that the mm. house is well maintained. Um, that's that's the people who would have lived in thatched houses themselves and would have left them, you know, and moved into fine big houses. Mm. Uh, they really, really appreciate appreciate the fact that this one is being maintained. So I think there would be, nowadays, I think there would be um, a lot more regard for thatched houses. But having said that, I'm not sure that people who live in, in modern houses would want to come back and live in a thatched house because, you know, I mean, I know more, more, some of my own siblings who live in, in towns in, in in modern houses, which are very, very well insulated. Um, if they come to stay here in wintertime, they, they, they get very cold. They really feel the cold. So even though this the thatch makes the house look very cosy, and mm. it is obviously cosy compared to a, a, a completely uninsulated house, it's, they're not as warm as modern houses. They're cool in summer because uh, mm. they have thick walls and the thatch is thick. Uh, but they don't, and they're war sufficiently warm for us in winter time. But it's it's the, the living in a in a thatched house isn't as as comfortable, I think you'd say, as living in a modern house. But we're totally adjusted to that. That's not any problem to us. We mm. we still we did change the open fire to a stove, which mm. is a bit more efficient, um, and we yes. use we use wooden wooden logs. So I I suppose. There's appreciation of thatched houses and of the people who maintain thatched houses, but that's not to say everybody wants to move back into a thatched house. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. But the, the tide has turned a bit from, from where it was, say, in the 60s yes. and 70s when people wanted to move away from them. Exactly, exactly. I think now if you see a thatched house falling in, it's not that people don't have respect for them or, or, or like them. I think it's much more to do with money. Yes. That, that it's, it's, you have to be able to... to Put a bit of money together to, to nowadays to get attached on and whether or not you have the money it's still a huge investment it is it is a huge investment yeah yeah i mean we we really love and appreciate this house even though we we didn't come from thatched houses ourselves and we didn't we don't have the history going back in this house but we really love it and value it and, and value the area as well value living in an area which still has so much of the the heritage ways in mm -hmm. in how yes. the, the the structure of the place um, and I think I've, I've told you before, Paul, I've very much enjoyed during COVID, during the lockdown, digging up part of our front garden and finding <laughs> the foundations of some old, so big, big stones in the ground, the foundations of some old building, which, which nobody remembers. But there is a building 
shown in that location on the original Ordnance Survey maps from, I think it was 1839. Yes. And, and that's, I, I get a really good feeling from that. I love the connection to the structures of the past. Yes, yeah. A forgotten part of the old village of Clumbo. Yes, exactly. Exactly, yeah. And I, I have appreciated since I came here being able to talk to some of the old people in the area um, and getting an idea of what life was like here. And what I mean, really, n number one point is that people worked all the hours of the day. They, mm. they had to work very, very hard. But that's not to say they didn't enjoy life. There was a, a much simpler kind of a, a way of co communal living where, where people visited each other's houses and people met at the well, as I think we commented on that in the booklet on the wells on the yes. Amazon Heritage Society website also, um, and that, the, that there was much more simple communal living. Mm -hmm. And do you think that has helped you to build up an appreciation for the, the traditional village, talking to people who remember a time when all of the, the private houses in the village were thatched? Definitely. It, it really has. It, I mean, when I walk back the road here, I'm I'm... I, or even, you know, there are various, various little borings, kinds of rights of way or in, into common land. Um, you know, from time to time, I'm very conscious of the people who constructed those borings and the people who walked those borings and the animals that were brought up and down. Um, this definitely, definitely has helped me to connect more with the, with the heritage. And do you think living in a village that has so many attached houses still, that, that there's a kind of a community there as well that helps motivate people to maintain them? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, of course, there are blow-ins like ourselves here, <laughs> but there's still a good proportion of people who, who were born and raised here. And, and people like you also, Paul, who know all the interconnections between people, the, the, all the relationships going way back. It's, it's a really lovely aspect of, of living here that, it's, and not that I, I suppose I'll never, I'll never feel fully connected in the same way that somebody who's been here for their whole lives and whose ancestors mm. go way back. But I mean, I am. I, I do come from from Ireland myself, and you know, even though Pete doesn't, we also both very, very much appreciate being part of this community, um, and being part of the old traditions. You know, I mean, if somebody sadly dies in the area, we all, even though nowadays all you can do is go and line the road to show your appreciation mm. of the person, there is there is a sense of belonging to a much bigger mm. community. Very good. So there are still a number of Thatchers in the county and in the local area. How do you go about finding a Thatcher nowadays? Yeah, th there are. It's it's still very much word of mouth, Paul. <laughs> like we, we met Marika because she was doing a repair mm. job on the house next door. Uh, you know, we knew that, that the, the Duggins weren't working. John Joe and, and Anthony weren't thatching anymore. To, mm. Anthony does a small amount, but they weren't really available to us. So, uh, so that was a personal contact. Um, there are other Thatchers. Marika has given me the name of other Thatchers. Um, in the area and maybe the Heritage Society, if I could um, get their permission, maybe to put their names and phone numbers on the Heritage Society yeah. website. And that, if, that if anyone is interested in, in touching or looking to have a house touched, absolutely contact us as well. Yeah, exactly. And we, we could we could uh, at least do some investigation from them. Um, because one of the things I became aware of is th Thatchers do interact with each other because while Marika was here Thatching, every now and then somebody would appear outside and it would have been another Thatcher to have a chat with her or they'd ah, swap materials nice. a little bit. Uh, I, I don't mean not, not the reeds so much as the other accoutrements, some scallops mm. or various bits and pieces. So I could, uh, we could maybe work on that to try and help people out because I, I don't think, I don't know, maybe you could do a Google search, but I don't know where, where I'm not sure that Thatchers operate very much like that. I think it is still word of mm. mouth. Are there any other issues then that you've encountered that, that cause difficulties in relation to living in a thatched house? Yes, yes. There's, there's one that I might mention that came up this time, which is we, we needed to get our chimney raised because they read ridge was going to be a bit higher than the than the previous ridge on the top of the roof we need plus the chimney in general was a bit too close to the thatch mm. for comfort yes so we needed to get somebody to, to raise the chimney so i got online and and um, got in contact with different people who advertised that they did chimney work local people or people within county galway but they weren't prepared to work on an old thatched house mm. so i had to resort to the word of mouth job and made contact with a friend who lives in an old house and asked her if she knew anybody who worked on chimneys and she gave me the name of a local man and he did the work he was perfectly happy to do the work so i could 
find out from that person if he's happy to have his name put on our on on the Enid, on the Heritage Society website. Very good. So that might that might be a help to people. And then the other big issue that people often say, what about insurance? Mm. And uh, now I think I can name them without asking their permission. FBD do insure mm. thatched houses. Okay. We're and again, I'm not. I'm happy to say, I don't mind saying how much we pay, so people will have an idea. At this stage, it's about eight hundred and fifty euro per annum to insure okay. the house, which we don't think is extreme for an unusual type of house. Yeah, for one with which there's more risk associated, I suppose. Exactly. Oh, and, and that reminds me of something else: risk and insurance, and that is to get the grant from the Department of the Environment. You have to have uh, smoke and heat alarms fitted with mains electricity. We, we've always had the battery operated mm. alarms and I would have checked them all at regular intervals to make sure the batteries were operating. But you have to have the um, the, the mains uh, alarms fitted. So that's a that's a requirement. You have to show them that you have that done. OK, so just another practical issue. There are probably others, but I think we've covered the main ones. Mm. Can I ask, do you mind telling us how much it, it does cost? To thatch a house now? No, I don't mind a bit. It co th this job cost sixteen and a half thousand euro. Mm. Quite a big sum. So a mm -hmm. hefty amount of money. Um, and as you said, you were successful in getting fifty percent of the amount from the the two grant schemes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that's uh, actually that's something else. Uh, I I did call to a local older person who lives on his own, uh, just to tell him that um, the date for applying for the the council heritage grant is January. There's only one time of year you can apply for that, and that is in January. And I've said I'll, I'll give him a hand, having gone through the process mm. uh, with doing that. But the other one, the Department of the Environment, you can apply any time of year. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. So again, again, there, the importance of talking to people and, and networking with people who live in thatched houses and helping each other out. Exactly. Very important. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's all we have time for today. Thanks very much, Evelyn, for joining me for this first episode. You're very welcome, Paul, and I'm honoured to be doing the first episode with you. I hope we can continue it, and if any of our listeners have ideas for future episodes, please get in touch. <laughs>